Hello, everyone. Welcome to Penn Engineering Online. Um, today, we have a great webinar planned for you. We're going to give you a wonderful overview on the MCIT online program. Um, so we're, we're so happy to see so many of you today. Um, we have a great turnout and we're thrilled. I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Jackie Panto. I am the program admissions manager and I'm kind of a newbie around here. I'm the new kid on the block. I've only been here for about two months. I'm um, actually, if I think of it, I think tomorrow is actually my two month anniversary. So I'm really thrilled to be part of such a great team. And I'm really looking forward to working with all of you and helping you through the process. So um, let me give you just a little bit of information about the webinar today and let you know how we're gonna structure it. Um, and we have some awesome guest speakers for you today. You guys are so lucky that you signed up for this webinar because we really do have some great um, presenters today. So first up, first part of the webinar, um, we have Dr. Thomas Farmer. And Tom is the, um, he's actually the program director for the MCIT online program. Um, and he's gonna bring you through the program curriculum um, talk a little bit about how the course is set up. Um, and then we have Olivia Roth. And Olivia is the, um, she is the director of online academic programs. Olivia is going to bring you through the application process, talk about the app application elements. Um, and again, what better person to talk about the application um, than our uh, director of online academic programs. So you're really in great hands. You've got the pro program director of the entire MCIT program, giving you an overview, and you have Olivia talking about the application. So you're in great hands. This was an awesome webinar for you to choose today. After we go through all of that, um, then we'll have some plenty of time for questions and answers. We'll leave about 15, 20 minutes for questions and answers. Um, and hopefully, I feel really confident that we're going to address all of your concerns and answer all of your questions today. So before we get started, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, number one, the session is being recorded today. Um, so if you get to the weekend and you totally forget everything we said, you can rewatch the webinar. You can watch it as many times as you want. Um, the second thing I mentioned questions and answers. So in the, um, in the Zoom, there's a function within Zoom called Q&A. That's where you wanna post your questions. Um, and we also have members of our admission um, team behind the scenes answering those questions. So some will get answered throughout the webinar and others will get answered uh, at the end of the webinar as well. Just want to give a shout out. Um, we have Erin Graves and we have Coley Coleman. They're behind the scenes. They're helping us out today. So thank you so much for doing Yay. that for us. Yay, we appreciate it. And um, I think I've hit all the points. So I am going to turn it over um, to Dr. Tom Farmer. Tom, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. So it's all yours. Thank you for having me. Uh, that was such a nice introduction. <laughs> I'm only going to let it down after that. But thank you, Jackie. Um, well, uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to the to, to the webinar. It's a pleasure to be here. I um, wanted to give you just a little introduction, uh, just my background. Uh, I am the program director for MCIT Online, and um, I've been here at Penn since about 2012, and I've been involved with the MCIT online, or actually MCIT on campus program at the beginning. So I've been with MCIT for a long time. Um, I'm also uh, the instructor for course uh, 593, uh, Introduction to uh, Computer Systems. Um, and so you'll have me maybe in your first semester here, <laughs> if you're, you know, when you're admitted. And um, a little bit about my, you know, background is uh, for me, I was a programmer at AT&T Labs for about seven years right after college. Um, I started as just um, a system tester and I moved uh, into becoming a uh, systems administrator uh, for Linux systems. And then I uh, started to work as a programmer there. So I kind of got my... Uh, uh, my hands dirty with that, really getting into code, started as a junior programmer um, on a big team, um, you know, a million code line project that I was a part of and lucky to be a piece of. Uh, and then I worked uh, for a while to become a senior programmer there um, until finally I um, became a subject matter expert there in, in something called asynchronous distributed computing. Um, that happened while I was working on my master's degree at night. So I, you know, kind of always sympathize with everyone in MCIT online because I feel like we were in, I was in the same position as you at one point or another. 
um, where I, I was commuting because we didn't really have a very good online system then in 2002. Um, but yeah, I worked on my master's degree in computer science uh, at night. And then, you know, when I was finished, I was able to kind of get promoted a little bit uh, and became that senior programmer at AT&T. Um, I really loved writing software very, very much. And, you know, sometimes people ask me, why did you leave? Uh, I really loved it at at and It was a great place. Um, but there was a part of me that really just wanted to know more about the hardware inside a computer. I had been writing software for so long. I had my, um, you know, my undergraduate degree in computer science and my master's degree in computer science. And I had debated going back for a PhD in computer science, but I thought maybe instead I would get a PhD in computer engineering because I really wanted to learn more about hardware and how hardware and software connect. So um, I uh, got married and I quit my job. <laughs> and that was an important order. I, uh, quitting your job first and then proposing never works out very well. So uh, I, I, I tried to make that make sense. Uh, luckily, my wife said yes. Um, I packed up we packed up she was in school too at the time um and i moved to uh, washington dc and i started working on my phd in computer engineering at about 27 years old and um you know that was the beginning of a, a very long endeavor into uh, understanding how a computer works inside and I really knew nothing about that. And there was so much for me to learn and I was a teaching assistant for a long time where I really kind of got into, you know, everything that's inside a computer and I was teaching people how to do it. I found the best way for me to kind of get through those uh, basic courses that I really wished I'd had at, in computer engineering. The best way I could do it was to, to TA for some of those classes. So um, it was kind of like having a dual education. I was getting my undergraduate in computer engineering. I was working on my PhD in computer engineering and um, really just having a great time, just sort of immersing myself in everything uh, computer engineering. Uh, during that time, um, I also worked uh, doing research at the US Army Research Lab in um, College Park, Maryland. Um, and uh, after I finished my PhD uh, at George Washington, I went to uh, continue at the Army Research Lab and started doing a postdoctoral fellow there for two years. Um, and after that time, um, I joined uh, Penn in uh, 2012. So I've had, you know, good experiences in terms of, you know, I was working in the profession for a long time, worked in academia for a while. Now I'm sort of professionally, uh, you know, employed as an academic um, here at Penn. And uh, I've been enjoying it ever since, you know, I came. So I've been here almost a decade and uh, I really love being at Penn and I love teaching my courses and I've been honored to be the program director for the last year. So that's, that's still really new to me, but I'm, I'm learning and uh, we have just this wonderful team um, that helps us, you know, <laughs> make this program wonderful. Um, and over the course of those last 10 years, I've been very lucky to have uh, two daughters, uh, Eleanor and Molly, they keep me busy. Sometimes you see them on camera uh, during office hour sessions. So uh, hopefully you'll get to meet them as well. Uh, so that's, that's about me, a little bit of my background. And uh, what I wanted to kind of talk about next was to get into the statistics of MCIT online. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, 1,500, roughly 1,500, uh, 1,516 students active in the program. 56% of them are international students. We represent, or they represent 39 countries. 42% um, are women. And the age range of our students uh, ranges from 22 to 64. So we have, I think, just a wonderful representation of the world in MCIT online. And that just makes teaching uh, at MCIT online wonderful because you just get to meet such a wonderful group of students just from every different background. And it just is, uh, it makes it fascinating to teach. And I think as a student, it makes it, you know, wonderful to be in, in a group that is really diverse and, uh, you know, really rich with people with so many different backgrounds. I was, um, a little bit more about, you know, MCIT online in terms of, you know, the background of it. It, it did start, as I mentioned before, as an on-campus program in 2001. Um, uh, we decided to make it into an online program, you know, once that technology to make it into an MCI, into an online program really became very rich uh, and capable of doing that. Uh, and the beauty of the MCIT online program is we, we asked all the instructors of MCIT on campus 
to, to basically take their course, uh, the courses that they, you know, teach on, on, on campus and make them online courses. But we did it with a, you know, really wonderful professional group that helped us. And it made it so each of us, and I mean, I'm speaking from my own background, but I, you know, I know that the other instructors had the same one as well. You know, they got to take their courses and really go through them, you know, with a fine tooth, tooth comb and think about stuff that really works and stuff that didn't work. Um, and really incorporated into a new way of showing their material, like into bite-sized pieces um, that really kind of helped us all rearrange our courses and really made the courses better just in, in uh, you know, in terms of making them, putting them online, because it really kind of gave us this time to enrich ourselves back in our courses and the content and see what really was wonderful and what should be promoted in the course and what would really make the course the very best version of itself. So you get really the most polished, I think, beautiful version of each course that we have on campus. And we've all taken that back to our on-campus courses as well, but it is a really wonderful sort of, um, you know, uh, feeling where we get to kind of rotate things through on campus and then back to online and, and back and forth, you know, learning things that work um, in both domains. So uh, the knowledge that you, you know, receive in the MCIT online program, um, is, is the same that is, is uh, you know, is given in a, you know, in a computer science uh, master's degree. So you really get all that same basic knowledge in terms of, uh, you know, all the things you sh should know about computer science, uh, the foundations, uh, you know, the theory, the math, as well as, you know, hands-on ability to, to program and to engineer systems and, you know, really scale something to size and really learn how to engineer, uh, you know, a software. Uh, to a considerable degree, you know, to give you really great hands-on knowledge. So you really get the best of both worlds in MCIT uh, online. Um, the nice part also is that when you graduate, you graduate with a degree from Penn. It doesn't say Penn online or anything like that. It says MCIT and it's, it's wonderful. So your degree is the same as an MCIT on campus uh, degree. Um, and that really makes it, you know, really quite wonderful in terms of, uh, you know, you work just as hard as any other student, so it should be the same degree. And so that's that's exactly the way we feel is that, you know, you, you're a Penn student all the way through. Um, it is also, as I, you know, the slide is reminding me to, to mention it, it is the first of its kind uh, graduate level degree um, in computer science tailored for non-computer uh, science majors. So if you're coming to us with, you know, degrees in other areas, that's wonderful. And I always sort of, Think back to myself, you know, I wish something like this existed for computer engineering when I was trying to do a computer engineering uh, PhD, um, because the fact that you could have a different background, you know, coming to it would, would just have been a wonderful thing. But that's, that's what we have here with MCIT Online. And I think that really um, is what makes it so wonderful and popular uh, as, as a program. So on the next slide, a little bit about our MCIT online uh, curriculum. This, um, you know, ultimately you're, you're going to be taking 10 courses. Um, how quickly or how slowly you go through the 10 courses is entirely up to you. We have students that take one course at a time and they take it every semester, you know, like the fall, the, the spring and the summer taking courses all year round. Um, or we have some students that take two courses, sometimes three, but uh, that to me is, is too much, depending on what you're doing. You know, if you're working full time, I, as I did when I was working full time, I took, you know, one course at a time to do my master's and that, that worked out to be just great. At the end, I kind of sped it up a little once I got the hang of it. But yes, we definitely have people taking, uh, you know, two to three courses a semester. Um, it breaks into basically a six and four situation where we have six core classes that everyone must take. Um, the list is here on, on, on the slides. Um, and it starts with basically an introduction to software development. So you're kind of learning, you know, the basics of software development, and how to engineer things in, uh, in terms of building programs that, that will scale. Uh, then you at, maybe at the same time, or maybe next, you're taking this course and uh, learning the mathematical foundations of computer science um, in such a way that, you know, remind, remind yourself that it, it's meant for people without a, a computer science background, without a pure math background. So it's very, you know, it's, it's taught well and kind of, you know, brings people from whatever math background they're, they're with, they're at, and they're comfortable with to, you know, to the point where you're, you have enough mathematical rigor 
uh, to, you know, to succeed in computer science. Um, you take my course, which is that one introduction to computer systems. Um, uh, that one is all about, uh, it's, you know, it goes, it's, it's a pretty rigorous course in terms of it goes to the lowest level, goes from transistors, you know, what are they, uh, how do they work, um, up to something called assembly programming, and then finally to C programming. Uh, and the intention of the course is to really show you, and this is why I love teaching this course, how hardware and software talk to one another. So, you know, you really get that in that particular course. And that's why it's a, a core course, because we think that's really important for everyone to have um, as a computer uh, scientist. Um, then you move to data structures and software design. So, you've, you know, you've got a lot of the basics down at that point, and you get into data structures to so sort of you know, bringing it up a level and uh, seeing, you know, how to perfect your software and how to contain the data in your program in an appropriate way um, and how to design it so it will scale um, to, you know, larger systems. Um, then we get into computer systems programming and that, you know, is a course where you learn all about operating systems. Uh, so, you know, learning about Linux, learning about Mac OS, uh, you know, learning about Windows, what, what underpins them, what's inside them, how do they work, how do you program parts of those systems. That's, that's a really cool course um, and is, you know, usually the one folks take right after 593. Um, and then we get to um, 596 where you talk about algorithms and computation. So, you know, there's a lot of things that have been that have been successfully done in computer science, like good ways of going about solving some programs, uh, some problems. And so you learn some of those classic approaches, as well as ways to kind of develop your own, you know, approaches to solving them. Um, and so those six courses together really, you know, instill in you all of the background that you need to become really successful in computer science. Um, the next four courses that you take after that are elective courses, and we have a, a list of, I, I want to say it's about 10 plus courses that you can uh, get into, and they're, you, you choose, you know, one of the, any one of those topics that interests you, um, and with the six core courses under your belt at that point, you have enough background to succeed in any one of them. So if you're interested in artificial intelligence, that's that's there for you to take that course. If you're interested in computer security, you know things of that nature. If you're if you're interested in uh, large, you know, programming with lots of data, uh, you know, machine learning type approach to things, that's there as well. And we have you know lists of them uh, of all the courses uh, and what's covered in each one. But they're really awesome because you get to take you know things that just totally interest you, and uh, you know you start to get a little bit more specific in your degree uh, and specialize a little bit. So that's our, that's our curriculum. Um, and I think, you know, after those 10 courses, you really will feel like you're a computer scientist and you really will be one of them. So it's a, it's a wonderful feeling once you finish these, these 10 courses. I want to say the next uh, slide is going is it going over to you, Olivia? I'm so sorry. I couldn't remember <laughs> if this was me or this is you. And I, I Either way, steal um, the classes, but uh, I mean, I can talk to it a little bit. If I'm missing something, let me know. Um, just from my own experience, on-demand lecture videos. You know, like what is your weekly, you know, you know, schedule looking like? Um, all of our videos are on demand, all of our lectures. So you basically just pick and choose. Well, not pick and choose. You have to do certain videos, but you do it at your own time um, to, you know, cover course materials. So there's no specific real time session that you have to join or anything like that. It's always, you know, on your schedule. Um, we have discussion forums for each of our courses. And so, you know, you can post questions anytime you have one and we get, you know, answers to those really quickly uh, in all of our courses. Uh, we have wonderful uh, staff of uh, teaching assistants that, you know, uh, that, that work, you know, to address questions on all these discussion forums. Um, we have, of course, weekly and biweekly deadlines, depending on the course uh, for the homework assignments and programming projects. Um, and so, you know, you're, you know, depending on the, the course load you have, you, you'll have, you know, weekly assignments to biweekly assignments in each. And certainly you have access to both the teacher of the course and the teaching assistants uh, directly. We have, you know, Zoom based office hours. Um, and, you know, you can come in and join, uh, you know, a, um, like a community discussion, like an open office hour session where everyone, you know, anyone in the course can join at the same time. 
uh, and those are nice because it kind of you know brings a discussion type feel to the class um, as well as one-on-one -on -one, you know office hours with uh, with our teaching assistants um, if you're just trying to really you know solve a particular problem and you wanted answers to something very specific so I know that is definitely where I'm at least supposed to end so <laughs> I will now hand this <laughs> over and I, I'm so sorry if I stole your slide Olivia I couldn't remember oh but no to Olivia um Miss Olivia Roth. there's no such thing as stealing in <laughs> webinar land <laughs> good, good to know <laughs> Thank you. uh thanks so much Tom um yeah so I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about the MCIT online community and uh this is something I love to talk about because uh my team gets to um interact with admitted students and kind of foster some of that program level um, inclusivity. And so um, I think sometimes there can be a danger in an online program of students feeling isolated. And we definitely don't want that to happen. We want students to know that they belong to Penn. They belong to a really warm and generous community of students all around the world. And one of the ways that we found is a really helpful tool for connecting folks is um, an application called Slack, which is kind of like a chatting tool. And um, all students, when they join the program, are added to our instance of Slack. And so, as you can imagine, there's there's quite a few folks in there. Um, and so my team is in there to you know post announcements and and answer one off questions, but essentially it's a tool for the students to communicate with each other and it's become over time um, organically a very robust uh, community for the students to interact with each other, um, there are. There's a community channel, which is um, a channel that everybody is automatically added to so people can post you know general questions or. Um, you know fun thoughts that they're having, and then we also have uh, individual channels that people can choose to join. Um, and again they're created by the students, so some of them are based upon geography like you know MCIT um, Bay Area or MCIT Australia. Um, so some of them are geographical so people can connect with each other based on where they live others are. Um, more focused on like certain kind of career directions that people want to go in or uh, we have a pets channel and a humor channel that I love to browse uh, in between meetings um, and uh, we also have course channels uh, that the students can um, kind of use to form study groups or uh, you know commiserate over an assignment etc so that that has been a, a really wonderful tool for us um and i think you know it's optional so if people kind of want to just put their head down and get their work done and they don't feel the need for that bigger community feel then that's fine um, but for those who are interested in participating um, you'll find a really welcoming group of people uh, we also have a linkedin group for our students which is um, used for more long-term long-term networking opportunities uh, and then we also have a student form club which is um it's called mosa our mcit online student association and they um, organize hackathons organize uh, webinars with alumni uh, we actually breaking news have a second club forming um that's not officially ready to be unveiled yet but um, we're really excited about that as well and i think it shows that again we have students that are very engaged and are interested in uh, connecting with each other so um, my team hosts a lot of online events that are sort of extracurricular um, and then as well um, we try to have in-person events when it's safe um, so for example um, students are invited to come to campus when they're ready to graduate and participate in commencement. Um, and we also have uh, an event in the fall, typically here on campus, and then also a, um, a West Coast event in person in the spring. So all of that has been disrupted recently, but we're hoping to get back to that. And um, also, you know, once the faculty and staff start traveling again for different reasons, we can meet up with students uh, wherever we go, which is 
really exciting. Um, so yeah, if you live in Bora Bora, then I especially invite you to apply because we, we should probably come and visit you at some point. Um, okay, I think I'm ready for the next slide. Great, so these are some of the details about the application itself and the application process. So um, we have a deadline coming up for fall 2022, and that deadline is May 1st. So that is the day to um, get all of your materials in. And when I say May 1st, what I really mean is a week before that, or how about tomorrow? <laughs> Um, whenever you know, whenever possible, try try not to um, procrastinate because uh, you definitely want to get that weight off your shoulders of getting getting things submitted. And another thing I want to say about that is um, when you go online and fill out your application um, and you press submit, uh, your application is not necessarily complete even at that time because we still need to receive a minimum of two letters of recommendation. Uh, and in some cases, we need to receive your official um, English as English language proficiency scores. So um, that's another reason why we'd like to urge folks to get their applications in. Uh, we also have a Dean's Master's Scholarship, and that deadline is May 1st as well. But again, um, uh, you won't get the link for the scholarship until you press submit on the application. So another reason to go ahead and press submit um, and then uh, you'll get an automated email with a link to um, fill out the, the scholarship information. So um, you can see on the left-hand side of the screen the different elements of the application. And let me just remind myself how much time I have to talk about this. Okay, so, um, so yeah, there's a couple documents to upload. Uh, one is a resume, uh, which basically, um, this is a great place to just let us know about um, what you're currently doing professionally, as well as um, an important place to note any online classes that you've taken. Uh, we, we really want to know about that because um, anyone who has taken an online class or has experience online will be able to kind of jump into the program um, a little more easily, especially if you've been out of school for a while, then I would strongly recommend taking some kind of online class. Um, if you're a recent graduate, you've probably had online experience because of the pandemic. And so we're aware of that, but it's still helpful to note, note it explicitly whenever possible. Next is the personal statement. And so this is an opportunity to, um, again, give the admissions committee a bunch of information that's really important to us, including, you know, why you're interested in the program, why you're um, going to be really motivated, committed to the program. Um, you know, if you might be uh, on the borderline of being overqualified, you could address it there. Um, and again, I, I suggest um, highlighting any online experience you have and any quantitative experience you have with coursework there as well. We have a list of prompts on our website um, for the personal statement, and I would just urge you to um, make sure you address all of the prompts uh, thoroughly because they all matter. Um, and we, we really do look at every single application. So um, please take the time to do that. And, you know, it can also be helpful to have a friend or another person, you know, just kind of read it over, make sure that the flow makes sense. Um, and, and so it's, it's really polished once you submit. We also need your unofficial college transcripts. And so when I say unofficial, that means it can be a scanned copy. It does not need to be an official copy that's sent directly to us. Um, that, that, that will happen if you're admitted. In that case, we do need to have all of the official documents, but for the application process, they can be unofficial. Uh, but we do need to see transcripts for every academic credit that you have obtained. Uh, we have some students who uh, have, have long histories in academia. And so for, for you all, uh, it, it might be several documents and, and that's good. Um, this includes any transfer credits that you might have, just because again, we really wanna see a complete uh, academic history. 
And, and if you have a situation where maybe, you know, when you were a youngster, your, you know, grades weren't kind of where you would have wanted them to be, but then they've improved over time. Um, if something like that occurred, or if there were extenuating circumstances that kind of can explain uh, some of, of the, of the lower grades, uh, do tell us about that in your personal statement as well, because again, we, um, we take that into consideration. So there's a $90 non-refundable fee for the application. Um, and then there's letters of recommendation. So again, we need a minimum of two, and these should be from folks who have ideally evaluated you in some capacity. So that means um, not a colleague or a friend. Um, and I really, really want to stress that. Now, um, again, if you've been out of school for a while, you might not necessarily have professors who you can call up. And that's fine. It can be a supervisor from work, or it could be perhaps like a community member who has worked with you and um, you know, like a volunteering capacity, etc. So if you have questions or concerns about the people that you're asking um, to write letters for you, feel free to send us an email um, at online-admissions at seas.upenn.edu. That goes to our awesome admissions team and that they'd be happy to, to talk through um, any concerns that you might have. The GRE or GMAT is optional. Um, Again, if you're someone who has been um, out of school for a long time, or maybe you haven't, uh, maybe in your undergrad, you were a theater major like me and you, you didn't take that many quantitative courses at the time, then you could consider taking the GRE as a way to show kind of a um, standardized uh, testing view of your, your quantitative skills. I did take calculus. Um, but again, it was so long ago that I don't even know if that should should count. Um, if I myself was applying, I would instruct myself to uh, take a math class at a community college online. Um, and I would tell myself to take uh, computational thinking for problem solving and an introduction to Python and Java because um, again, we want we want folks to have some exposure in the sense that, uh, we want you to be pretty sure that this is something you really want to spend a lot of time on. So it was something, you know, for, for yourself as well to, to use in a, as an assessment tool. And so that we can evaluate your quantitative skills. Um, you know, you might have a hunch that you have quantitative abilities, but well, we won't be able to evaluate that very easily. Um, and then finally, the TOEFL is um, a English language proficiency exam, and this is needed if you um, went to school, went to school at a place that did not teach primarily in English. Um, if you did go to school and completed a degree at a school that was taught primarily in English, you can apply for a waiver for the TOEFL exam. And again, that uh, that link is sent to you after you press submit on your application. So go ahead and do so today. Um, on the right hand side, you can see some of our upcoming deadlines. I already mentioned May 1st. Um, all the decisions are released on the same day. So it's not a rolling situation. It's a one day situation on June 15th. So mark your calendars for that date. And, um, and then when you're admitted, uh, you have about four weeks to make a decision um, and you have to um, let us know by my birthday. So sidebar. Um, the orientation course starts in July. Um, it's, I was gonna say it's optional. It's actually not optional. Um, it, it needs to be completed before classes start. Um, you can do it on your own schedule, but we wanted to let you know that um, to put aside a, a, a little bit of time at least and effort um, towards the program before even the classes are available. Um, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say about that. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, this is the money slide. So um, each of our courses costs $3,200 for tuition. And we have 10 courses, so that um, adds up to $32,000. Then we also have a fee, which is, um, again, per course. So uh, it's $144 per course unit, and that adds up to $1,440. And the way the payment schedule is decided is 
you pay per semester and you pay based on how many courses you register for. So as Dr. Farmer mentioned, um, folks can sign up for, you know, just one or two or three courses each semester. Um, and um, if you pay, if you register for one course, you pay for one course that semester, et cetera. So there's no, you know, down payment or anything. Um, it's the payments are spread out across the, the time in the program. And we also have a Dean's Master's Scholarship, which is relatively new for us and we're delighted to offer it. Um, it is related to um, our mission of, of scholarship and teaching and research for the public good. Uh, we take into account uh, both the diversity of the applicants as well as the financial need. Um, so it's a kind of a combination of the two and it's available to US citizens and US permanent residents. Uh, and again, the uh, deadline is for that is May 1st as well. Uh, tuitions and fees may be subject to change. Um, typically, the tuition will increase a small amount each year. The student fee just went up $4. That's about how much it goes up every year. So you can factor that into your budget as well. Okay, I think we are ready to move on to questions. Um, so thank you so much for your time um, for our formal presentation, um, but we're also ready to, um, yeah, we're also ready to answer questions that you might have um, that maybe are not addressed on our website, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm taking a look. Our team has uh, sent us some of the questions. Um, that the students have sent in. And, and you're gonna laugh, Dr. Farmer, there's a question about a PhD. Something about this topic just keeps coming up for us. Um, I did see that question, I think, yeah. in the Q&A, right? It was, yes, in the- was it about um, the research area? Yeah, so it says, can you speak to prior student success in pursuing a PhD in CS and whether CS researchers have been available to students or if independent research was conducted with labs or researchers outside of Penn? I'm not sure about the labs and researchers outside of Penn. That one I'm not certain of. I know that we do try to incorporate students, you know, when they ask into the labs at Penn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that one we have more control over. Um, so yeah, we've had some students that have gotten in touch with, um, you know, researchers here at Penn, you know, essentially they're instructors at MCIT online and, um, you know, have done some research on, you know, as part of their uh, MCIT, a time while they're in MCIT online, it's not formally part of the program or anything like that. But yes, we've definitely had people do that because they're interested in getting a PhD in uh, CS. And so uh, it's a perfectly good master's program to lead to a PhD in computer computer science. So that I think that's usually quite nice, but it, it is known as what they call like a terminal master's degree, right? It's, it's not a research-based master's degree. So it's pure coursework. Um, the hope is you get a master's degree in computer uh, information technology. So. Yeah, exactly. And so students in our program can choose to supplement their, um, their education with research and they can, you know, they're always welcome to reach out to to faculty at Penn, typically, like you said, at Penn, not outside of it. Um, I know of at least one MCIT online student who did that and uh, went on to great uh, success. She got a pretty prestigious fellowship as well and, and is going to a really good school for exactly this PhD in CS. So, I mean, that's only one person. It's, it's, it's not the common route, um, but I think she proves that it's certainly possible. Yes, for sure. And plus our program is, is young still. So it's an yeah, online yeah. component. So to have one is big. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And um, I mean, certainly the um, on campus students uh, occasionally go on to a PhD right. uh, program as well. Okay. Um, I want to address question number two, and then I'm thinking maybe Jackie, you could address question number four after that. Um, so for question number two, it says, as a late career professional, what proportion of your students who took your course in their 50s made successful career switches, excluding those who remained in their own profession but applied what they knew to their work? So I'm happy to address that. Um, I don't know what the proportion is, but I do know of several, again, several examples of students who have done exactly this in their 50s. Um, 
and again, it's it's really exciting and and inspiring. Um, they don't they didn't give me permission to <laughs> tell you their names or their <laughs> specific stories, um, but the two that come to mind are both women uh, by coincidence. And um, like I said, I think there's a lot of support within the community for. I mean, the nature of MCIT is you don't have to be changing what you're doing. And yet it's, I think it's a natural fit with a lot of people and where they are in their lives. And so, for example, on campus, uh, most MCIT students are just out of undergrad and sort of career starters. Whereas what we see in, in the online program is mostly, uh, I'm just gonna say vast majority are um, mid-career working professionals. And so, um, there are certainly a lot of different people who uh, are career switchers and career advancers. Um, and what I'll say is this, if you're the one who asked that question, send us an email uh, at online-admissions and, and we might be able to put you in touch with one of the women that I was talking about um, so that uh, you can kind of get a sense of what the experience was like for them. I know I've heard lots of different students say, describe the experiences that their brain was getting rewired, um, which is a very intense experience, if you can imagine that. Um, but also I think it's incredibly empowering because uh, they, you know, they go from point A to point Z at such a, an accelerated rate and in a way that um, they kind of amaze themselves. So um, yeah, we do have a broad uh, age range and um, we, we love to see those different, the diversity in, in many different forms. Yeah, that, that is always, oh, I will always harp on that because it really is the best. I was on, I had my online office hours the other day and I was just delighted that there were three accountants on my, <laughs> in my group. <laughs> And a dentist and I mean, we just had everybody and it's just wonderful yeah. you know so many backgrounds that some are sciencey some are not you know um had a theater major in there uh, you know had a lot of different a lot of wonderful backgrounds. theater major you say uh-huh yes uh-huh <laughs> <laughs> luckily there were no video cameras that record my theater experience <laughs> Oh, oh, oh yeah it's bad okay, <laughs> okay we'll have to talk later <laughs> Should we run through some more of the Q and A questions? I I don't have them numbered the way that you have them. I think. Oh yeah, yeah. I think, um, I think Jackie is going to take another one about uh, letters of recommendation. Sure, okay. I'm happy to take that one. So we do have a question about letter of recommendation, um, and the question is: Is there a preference for letters of recommendation from academia versus work for someone who has uh, not too long been out of college? Um, and has some work experience so far, is it better to have a recommendation from academia to showcase their academic abilities? So the answer to that question is really either one would be fine. Um, the, the thing that you wanna remember about your letters of recommendation is you wanna choose um, people um, that are going to um, um, portray you or to explain that you are um, a great candidate for the program based on things that they've observed um, basically in the past. So if it's a past professor or a current supervisor, um, it doesn't really matter, but you want somebody that can really um, explain what it is, what it is about you that's gonna make you um, a great MCIT online student. So that's the most important thing I think um, that you need to be concerned with. So either one is definitely gonna work, no problem. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. And I also just thought of, um, kind of a more concrete example is that now and then we'll see a letter from a professor that says something like, this student was a student in my class. <laughs> they attended class and they received a grade. You know, what? It, it, it's very apparent that they're not very familiar with the student. And so I would say that that letter would be less valuable than something from uh, a supervisor or, you know, somebody that you have a dotted line to, let's say, who is much more familiar with your grit and your, you know, perseverance and your problem solving skills and your communication skills. Mm -hmm. um, so like Jackie was saying, it's, it's more important that they have 
specific knowledge about about you without a doubt than whether it's you know academia or not without a doubt for sure yeah okay um so some questions about like background coming in like those that's computer courses we have a little bit before the program that they could take those certificate type courses maybe i kind of saw that question asked a couple of times in a couple of different ways should we talk a little okay. bit about that yeah one, sure so i know um i know our team is answering some of the questions behind the scenes but Surely. if there's um common questions then we're happy to address them so i kind of uh, flippantly referred to these earlier but um if you're someone that does not have a lot of exposure to computer science and you're kind of wondering whether this might be the direction you want to go in or like i said you haven't had a lot of online experience or you just want to um really show off how how interested you are in her program and and make your application as strong as possible then uh, we have two different um products that i would recommend one and we'll we'll put some information on the screen at the end but um one of them is for like true beginners it's um it's called computational thinking for problem solving and it really um holds your hand through the basics of what it means to start thinking along the lines of a computer in terms of like the logic and the structure. Um, I'm proud to say I have done about two weeks of it, so <laughs> not to awesome. brag. <laughs> They're good course. I, 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 I've reviewed them. I, I never had the chance to take them. They are really Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, that one, um, that one has uh, footage from the, it's like Penn has a training center for puppies. Um, and they used the, they used it as a case study. So I mean, it's worth it just for for the puppy cam. Um, <laughs> but but yes, you're right. It's very well done. Um, and and then kind of the next step after that is um, a specialization, which is a series of four courses, and um, it's called Introduction to Java and Python. Uh, that's on. I think I'm. I flipped it. It's Python and Java, but anyway, it'll come up in a search for you on Coursera, and it's a series of four courses that introduce you to those two programming languages. Um, the cool thing about those is that uh, they're taught by the same professor who teaches our first course in the degree program, uh, Brandon Kurkowski. And so, in fact, it's the same videos that are used um, in our degree program as well. So you get kind of a flavor of what that experience is like with the caveat of um, the the practice assign the assignments in the specialization are considered to be like practice side assignments in the in the degree. So um, imagine that the degree assignments are like two hundred times harder or something like that, and then <laughs> that'll give you an idea of um, whether you think it's a good fit or not. But um, those are well rated as well, and. Um, again, can kind of, I mean, it's just, so basically the core courses are, you could kind of divide them into programming courses, uh, math courses and hardware courses. So um, this is a, just a small taste of a programming course. Um, the math courses are more along the lines of discrete math. So if you haven't taken a math class in a while or never taken a discrete math class, that's a really great way to, again, prepare and or show your interest um, and then there's no way to prepare for your course, Tom. That's just a whole new. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's meant to take you from wherever you are, you know. Yeah. So that that no need to prepare that one. Don't yeah, come, yeah. don't come afraid. <laughs> it really is a good. That's you know, that's where the brain uh, rewiring really really uh, occurs. Oh, that's so sad. <laughs> In a good way. Though. In a good way. Yeah, yeah. Good no, way. people love that. Um, uh, yeah. So that was a long answer to uh, to that question. I saw one that came in with my name in it, so I might as well try to answer that one there. Yeah, so for Matthew, it was a question for Professor Farmer. Could you talk about what career paths past candidates have taken after graduation in the various areas of computer um, engineering, data science, AI, ML, blockchain, and how the foundational skills in the program have translated for alumni and industry higher fields of research? I mean, it, our career paths are, you know, as varied as our students, right? So we have a lot of students, you know, they're already working. And in some cases, they're just taking this to make maybe just a, maybe a slight promotion at work, uh, you know, or, or maybe they really want a complete career change. And so 
yeah, we, we definitely have a lot of different paths that people go in after, after the program. So all of the ones you have mentioned, data science, AI, ML, <laughs> blocked, those, those are paths that folks end up in, um, uh, you know, and that's, that's a good place. Some people become programmers, you know, just uh, you know, straight programmers after that, you know, a, a lot of different things uh, that people take from the program and can go immediately and start working. Um, so those foundational skills and program in the program really directly translate uh, for alumni that are just hoping to go right away and use them. Um, and so you'll have skills that you can put immediately to, to use. Yeah, absolutely. So like, like you said, some, some folks will do kind of, I guess the more traditional route of like going through and um, transitioning to being like a software developer mm -hmm. or product manager. Um, we have a lot of students that do that, but we also have students who um, stay within their current field mm -hmm. and um, kind of infuse the computer science knowledge that they have into their field, whether it's healthcare or research or um, accounting, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> architecture. We, we have folks that do that. And uh, I asked the team to post a link to our most recent career outcomes report um, in the chat. So um, definitely take a look at that. It's um, you know, small numbers of students that have graduated from the online program so far, but it'll be uh, exponentially increasing. Um, and the outcomes that we see are very similar to what we see on campus. Um, and then we also have students who sort of want to, um, let's just say, don't necessarily want to go into like Silicon Valley and they stay in like education, for example, we have a good number of teachers who um, want to put their um, knowledge in, in that arena. So it's again, um, not to show off, but our students are really diverse in a lot of different ways, including the outcomes that they choose. Yeah. I see a computer law attorney there and saying, is this program good for a computer law attorney? I, that kind of go. adds to what Olivia's saying. Yeah, you may, you'll yeah. probably stay as a computer law attorney, but you'll have a lot more background now that you can, you know, use uh, to, to enrich your, your career uh, that you already are yeah. <laughs> in. <laughs> so yeah. I would say, yes, it is good for a computer law attorney. Yeah. And I would say, um, you know, one, one of the speeches that I give regularly is that um, if a person uh, feels that learning a uh, programming language would enhance their job. Um, that is pretty easily achieved through something like a boot camp, and so um, a boot camp might be the right level that fits what you're looking for, uh, because this program is um, extremely <laughs> rigorous and um, like covers the foundations of computer science so thoroughly that you completely understand, I guess, what's going on, and then you can teach yourself any programming language. Right. Now, while that is an incredible superpower, um, it may be more than what some people really need. And so, again, we want to just be as clear as possible about what the experience is like so that folks who apply, you know, are um, aware of, of what they're getting and, and um, you know, excited to um, put in the time and effort that is needed to uh, um, go through this this cool journey. We are at 355. Um, I'll just quickly, there was a question about MCIT online students participating in the Penn career fairs oh, yeah. on campus. So what I'll say about that is um, most of those career fairs on campus are designed for undergraduate students. So our students um, are not um, invited to those career fairs because we have our own specialized MCIT online career expo uh, designed by our um, associate director of professional development and um, networking. So um, she really customizes it for MCIT online students. And um, I don't know if you saw the announcement, but we actually are um, debuting a second degree program in January which is a master of science in engineering and data science. Uh, and so our, our little uh, scrappy program is, is growing. And, um, and that just means that we'll have a bigger breadth of um, employers and, and uh, folks to network with over time. So 
um, I, I'm really proud of our uh, career services that we offer. Uh, it's also a lifetime service as well. So um, you get access to our uh, career services um, even after you graduate. So with that, I'll turn it to you, Jackie. Great, thank you so much, Olivia and Tom. We appreciate it. Um, it's great. So what we're gonna do now is just um, finish up and let you know, um, I think we've done a really good job of answering your questions and hopefully we've um, kind of addressed all of your concerns that you had before uh, before the webinar started. Um, but what we wanted to do, we're gonna uh, put a slide up here that shows you just in case after the webinar is over, you still have some questions or you think of something that maybe you didn't ask. There's lots of places that you can go to find the information. Um, first off, our website, um, we have an excellent uh, facts database in our website. So if you go there, um, the link is, is there on the screen for you. You probably can find um, a lot of answers to your questions right there. Um, if that doesn't work and you still you didn't find the answer and you still have questions for us, I know um, Olivia had mentioned time and time again throughout the presentation, our email address, please feel free to email us. We will get right back to you, usually within 24 hours. Um, you see the email there. Um, also, you can sign up for our mailing list. We do have a mailing list, so please feel free to sign up for that. Um, one thing that's not here is we do have office hours. Um, the office hours are on You Can Book Me. Um, and uh, they're in 15 minute slots. We offer uh, Tuesdays and Thursday office hours. Please feel free um, if you feel the need to meet with uh, someone on the admissions team, um, we'd be happy to meet with you. So sign up for those office hours as well. And then Olivia um, and, and uh, Dr. Farmer did talk a little bit about um, the two um, open courses, the two Coursera courses, the introduction, introduction to programming with um, Python and Java. That's a specialization. It's made up of four courses. Um, and there's also the computational thinking um, for problem solving. So those are, again, they're a great way. If you haven't taken an online course, um, that's a great way to get a feel for the program and get a feel what, for what online learning is. So they may be a great starting ground for you. Um, so lots of different options of things that you can do even when after um, this webinar is over. So we really appreciate your time today. We are so happy to see so many that joined us. Thank you to Olivia. Thank you, Dr. Farmer. Um, you guys did an awesome job. We appreciate it. So thanks so much and we'll see you guys soon. Take care. Great to see everybody. See yeah. you soon.